Hello and welcome to another episode of the Real Estate Investing Club. I'm your host, Gabe Peterson, and this is the place investors go to gain actionable advice, learn about current market trends, and hear war stories from other professional investors out there in the field today. Before we get started, I have two quick housekeeping items for you. First, if you like this episode, we would very much appreciate a like, subscribe, and share. It is the best way to support the show and keep it running far into the future. Second, if you're a new investor looking to get started in real estate or an experienced investor looking to take your investing to the next level, I've created an ebook just for you that will cover how to find deals that are actually deals, how to finance those deals with little to no money down, and how to exit those deals for maximum value. On top of that, I throw in an insane amount of free bonuses that you'll have access to once you buy the ebook. All I charge is our admin costs to keep this show running. So if you're serious about real estate investing and want to create both active and passive income as an investor, head on over to the website at therealestateinvestingclub.com and click on the button that says, get the ebook in the upper right-hand corner to grab yourself a copy. With that said, let's dive right in. Today, we have a very special guest with us ready to drop some investor knowledge on you. So buckle up, grab your pen and paper and enjoy the ride. All right. Welcome back to another episode of the Real Estate Investing Club. Today we have with us Chris Bennett. Chris has 14 years of real estate experience spanning self-storage and residential investment and brokerage. At PassiveInvesting.com, his responsibilities include sourcing self-storage deals and leading due diligence. And I actually just got back from a due diligence trip out in Texas. So I'm super stoked to have Chris here to talk about self-storage. Chris, thanks for hopping on the show. Absolutely. Thank you, Gabe. Appreciate it. Absolutely. So um, I told you before, we always start with stories here. So why don't you take us to the beginning? How did you get started in real estate in the first place? Sure. Yeah. So back in 2007, I got my real estate license, uh, was going to be a residential broker and uh, obviously didn't have the greatest uh, foresight at that point in time. So 20, <laughs> uh, 2008 hit, right? In 2008, 9, 10, 11, and so on. Yeah, it was a pretty rough time to get started in real estate. Uh, but that's okay. You know, uh, we did a few things in the foreclosure business and all that. And I wanted to pivot away from it. I'm kind of making a long story short. So I decided to go to school, ended up uh, at UNC Chapel Hill. Um, and kind of, to be honest with you, wanted to get away from real estate because my only experience of it was well, the residential foreclosure. <laughs> yeah, it was like the residential foreclosure stuff, uh, which wasn't, I mean, I was literally like evicting people from their homes. So that was my experience. Yeah. Uh, not good. We, I did work with a few investors who bought stuff cash, but you know, just it is what it is. So mm -hmm. I wanted to get away from that world and go do something different. So that's what I was planning on doing. Ironically, when I got to school at Chapel Hill, the only job slash internship I could find was at a real estate private equity uh, firm in Chapel Hill um, called Eller Capital. Daniel Eller, he's still out there doing syndications and all that for apartments. But I realized, oh my gosh, he's raising capital to go buy apartment complexes. And this was a whole new thing to me. So I worked there for two years in a row and just realized, oh my, this is like fantastic. I had no idea about syndication prior Much to our private than equity. Closures, right? <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. Yes. A hundred percent. So uh, to make a long story short, they have a real estate investment fund at the school. I applied to get on that. I was on, and they accepted me for that, uh, that role as a fund manager. Um, so we were actually managing friends and family, uh, friends and family money of the school. So that was really a great experience. We saw a, a wide range of different asset classes that we could invest in. Um, anyway, graduated, worked at a family office in Raleigh. We were doing apartment acquisitions. Couldn't make some of the numbers work on some of the deals. The market at that time, this is 2016, was was what we thought was overheated. But I mean, shoot, you know, if you thought that was overheated, like fast right. forward to now. So yeah. across yeah. the board, yeah. So anyway, we pivoted to storage, raised a small fund on Crowd Street to go and acquire storage from mom and pops. So that's what we did. Um, and that was pretty successful. Then fast forward, ended up doing some residential development, some other things and partnering up on storage. And then uh, just recently closed another deal uh, here in March, which we can talk about uh, either on this episode or the next one, however you want to do that. But anyway, that's, that's where we're at. I knew Dan Hanford, uh, one of the principals of passive investing when he first got started in uh, apartment investing. So I went to his very first meetup and stayed in touch since then. And Dan reached out and said, hey, what are you up to? We want to buy storage. We want to buy big deals. Let's talk. So I did. We did. And 
um, you know, we started, we partnered up, uh, I think it was in January, January, February of this year, really. Um, and so that's what we're doing is looking for storage deals across the Southeast. Cool, man. I love it. And I, uh, yeah. I like your story because um, I like hearing when people go into an internship, you know, they don't have a lot of experience in whatever the internship is, but then they find their career, you know, they, they fall in love with whatever that that is, because I feel like the, especially the education system today, we kind of lack that, um, that journeyman aspect where you're actually get to go out, you get to get your hands dirty and, uh, yeah. and understand what a thing is. Um, but that's what you did. You went, you got the internship, you, you fell yeah. in love with the path. Um, and you know, one thing led to another. Uh, and I like, I like kind of the evolution of your story. You know, you, some people, they think of real estate, like I'm going to do flips. This is what I see on HGTV. This is my career. This is what I want to do. They get into it. Um, they realize it's not what they thought, but then you just pivot. You started in apartment buildings. You realize it was getting too hot. Um, you pivoted to self storage, which is an yeah. awesome asset class to be in. So I like, yeah. uh, I like yeah. the evolution there. Yeah. I appreciate that. I think, I think, uh, I, I see a lot of posts on social media about education being kind of poo-pooed, you know, like the, the four-year college path. I mm -hmm. loved my education uh, and I focused, I knew, it, knew what I wanted to do. I think part of that is I went back as an older uh, person, I guess, with some life experience. So that helped mm -hmm. a lot, you know, in forging that path. Uh, and then obviously the education I got, they had hands-on experience there at the school. So you were in the trenches, you know, with the real estate fund, uh, looking at deals. They have a lot of, outside of that, they have a lot of opportunities with firms that come in and recruit students to go work, you know, internships and actually doing the stuff. Uh, and that's how you learn, you know? So a lot of people who want to get into like coaching and mentoring, they want to hire a coach. It's really hard. I think that's a good, good way to go. But if you don't do that, it's really hard to understand what you're doing because there's almost oh, yeah. like no training wheels. It's just like, just go do, like make an yeah. offer. Well, what do I do? Like, how do I make it? How do I, you know? <laughs> uh, so there's actually value to that. So uh, I kind of am a little bit uh, on the other side of the fence where I think if you have a good idea of what you want to do, like go get an education and, and, and go that route, you know? Yep. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I, I'm I'm 100% with you, um, especially with real estate. You know, it seems so simple. Just go out, buy a property. You know, it's not that hard. You got cash, you transfer it over. But the actual steps, <laughs> um, there's a lot of money. Yeah. There's a lot of steps that go into it. And being able to see it from someone who's done there, who's been there, has been doing that before um, is invaluable. So um, yeah. going down yeah. a, a rabbit hole there. So let's, uh, I'm going to move back to self-storage. Um, let's so, do it. That's what you guys are in right now. I mean, you guys are, you're leading up the, the acquisition side of it, it sounds like. Um, yeah, so basically. Uh, go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. No, yeah, I was just going to say, why don't we just start, um, you know, tell us kind of what you think of the market today. Like, what, what do you see in stealth storage going forward? Yeah, the way, um, so if I have my. Oops, looks like Chris is having some connection issues. Um, so he is actually taking this call call from his car. Um, oh, he's coming back. Give him one Myself in the second. One second. Come on, Chris. We got you. We're holding out for you, buddy. All right, we're back. Chris had uh, Chris is um, taking the call from his car today, and uh, he had an issue, tech issue. You know, it happens. That's what happens uh, during COVID times or any time, really. Um, but we're back, Chris. I just asked you about the market today in self storage. So why don't you continue down that path? Yeah, sure. So uh, storage, the kind of the cat's out of the bag, and it's been out of the bag for a little while. In other words, it's not a secret anymore. It's not like, oh man, what are these you know buildings with these garage doors that roll up that people put stuff in? It's becoming more and more prevalent in the news. Uh, the Wall Street Journal actually just had an article like two days ago, I think it was about inflation and concerns for the real estate sector. And in that article, it talked about uh, if you have a short term lease, you can take advantage by raising rents over time to cover any uh, increases in your expenses. And it specifically mentioned both apartments and self storage as having shorter leases. Of course, storage, it's month to month. So if you need to raise rents, you can do so to cover your expenses. So all that to say, uh, the word is out on the street in Wall Street, uh, Main Street, that storage is a wonderful asset class. It did extremely well during the last pandemic, and it performed really well during the last recession uh, in 2010. So much so that the SBA, the Small Business Administration, started lending, uh, making loans on storage. So if you can imagine that for a second, you want to open up a small business. I don't know. I just pick on nail salons. You want to open up a nail salon. You go to the SBA. They'll give you, some, uh, give you a loan to be able to do that. 
they look at storage the same way. So mm -hmm. if you want to open up a storage facility or acquire one, they look at it as a business, an operating business, and will give you a loan. So that's how comfortable the government feels with self-storage and obviously the rest of the market. So what that has done has pushed up pricing because it's just simple supply and demand. You have more demand for storage acquisitions from buyers, both institutional and uh, smaller regional groups and mom and pop shops, you know, syndicate, syndicators and those kind of folks who are wanting to get into the business. So it's pushing up pricing. And so we have to expect that, yeah, you're not going to get, you know, uh, generally speaking on a well-located property, a cap rate of like six, 7% is probably not going to be the case for them on in-place uh, rents, right? So in other words, you're going to be paying a little bit more than you would have paid three or four years ago. That's just the way that it is. And that's the way it is in apartments and a lot of other uh, real estate asset classes, except for maybe retail hotels, something like that. Anyway, so uh, also that's the big picture of the market, right? So supply, demand, more demand for these assets. Prices are going up as a result. Um, and then if you look at it, kind of segment the market for a second. So maybe you have about 35,000 square feet or and under is one type of seller and one type of broker who works those kinds of deals, right? Uh, maybe a local broker uh, might have more of those kinds of deals. You see some of those, more of those deals like on LoopNet and other places like that. And then you have maybe 35,000 square feet and above, maybe 40,000 square feet and above. And you have a different type of broker who might focus solely on storage. Uh, you may or may not see those kinds of listings on LoopNet. Most likely would see them from a broker uh, via direct email or on LinkedIn or something like that, right? Uh, the larger deals, the 40,000 square feet and above, are going to be targeted by groups like us, uh, maybe like yourself or other institutional groups who, if they're a really well-located deal, uh, it's, it's, it's going to be bid up. Smaller deals, the pricing is still high, uh, but you're going to be competing more with like regional or local buyers uh, from that pool. Uh, what that also means is you have a whole different set of like parameters, criteria that you're looking at, the way you'll manage the deal. If it's a bigger deal, you can get third-party management in there. It's a little bit easier to do that. If it's a smaller deal, you might have to manage it yourself. Uh, if it's a bigger deal, blending options are going to be more wide and the rates and all that will be a bit better. If it's a smaller deal, you're going to have to go to a regional bank or a local bank or a credit union, something like that, or maybe even the SBA to get a deal like that done or private money to get a deal like that done. I'll give you one example on the institutional side. So we just had a call with the broker uh, today to get some feedback on an offer that we placed. It was a first round, then a best and final, and then they would make the decision and award, award uh, the deal to the buyer from there. So we came in pretty strong, we felt, and um, uh, I mean, we had well over, uh, I don't want to give away too much, but it was a large deal in a really strong market. I mean, incredibly strong, desirable market to be in. There's a moratorium on storage, et cetera. Uh, this deal is north of $10 million as far as purchase price. We put down uh, over $300,000 earnest money, uh, part of it going hard. Um, so it, we were very aggressive on this deal. We were outbid by a public, publicly traded company. Uh, all of us were outbid by over uh, half a million dollars. So yeah, I mean, that was it. Uh, and so there's, there's nothing, you know, that's okay. To lose to something like that is fine. Like it's a publicly traded company. Wasn't even one of the storage REITs. Mm. It was a publicly traded company getting into the business. So they were ready to go, you know, they came up a mil uh, not a million, half a million dollars from their first offer and obviously nobody else could get there. So that just shows you the competitive nature of these deals. So you're not going to win every single one. And I think your audience is probably saying, that's not my playground. I'm not going to play in that space, which is understandable. And then the second question that come to my mind was, well, how the heck do you make money on a deal on a situation like that? Well, when you're, when you're a uh, publicly traded company and your cost of capital is less than a point, you know, like you can pay more for assets and be okay with a 2% cash on cash return. You know, that's fine. So that's kind of where the market is. Very competitive, prices going up in all segments. Uh, and then just being aware of if you're playing in a certain space, who you're competing against and where your capital is going to come from as far as the uh, debt side. Yep. Yep. And that kind of, uh, that, that reflects what we're experiencing too. Even, uh, even deals from brokers. I mean, we're, we're seeing six, seven caps um, at the best. And it's, oh yeah, uh, yeah. Like it depends uh, on where it is and all that. Yeah. Yep. We find. I mean, the only deals that were um, the two deals that we have in a contract right now, we got off market from ourselves. We're just like crushing it with the with the direct mail. 
Um, and I feel like yeah. that's the only, only way you can do it is just, you have to go to the seller themselves. You got to talk to them. You got to, you got to negotiate yourself or else you're not going to get anything that, that makes sense. Um, if you get a loan behind that bad boy. So makes sense. Uh, we're in the, we're in the same boat there. Um, so, I mean, I told you before we jump on the show, this is a, I, I'm new to uh, self-storage. I, my main focus was mobile home parks for a while. Um, and now I'm switching over to self-storage just to try something new. Um, so I'm always interested to hear why people got into self-storage. Like what, what drew you into the asset class itself? Yeah, a couple things. One is when we started back, when I started back at the family office in Raleigh, we were doing uh, apartments and then pivoted to storage. I knew nothing about the asset class. Mm. Uh, so I had to do a bunch of research after doing the research. Uh, I realized there's one, an opportunity to buy from mom and pops. So mm -hmm. if somebody's coming from the uh, apartment world, for example, approximately three quarters or 75% of all apartments are owned by usually institutional investors or sophisticated right, owners, uh, and a small percentage are owned by uh, mom and pops or people that you can actually you know, contact and do a deal with directly. Mm -hmm. But those deals are usually... 20, 50, 75, 80 units, you know, on the smaller side. Storage is the flip of that, the reverse of that. Sorry, there's like a street cleaner behind me. I'm in my car. Uh, if you, I don't know if you can hear that or not. But anyway, okay. uh, storage is the reverse of that. So 75%, give or take, are owned by mom and pops. When we say a mom and pop, we say somebody, we mean uh, somebody who only owns one or maybe two facilities and that's it. 25% of all storage is owned by sophisticated or institutional investors who own at least two or more locations. Public so there is a bigger, yeah, public own. storage, U-Haul, <laughs> life storage, yeah. extra space, those guys, right? Yeah. So, um, uh, so there's an opportunity for the smaller investor uh, to, or the so smaller sophisticated investor to go and buy some of these deals that you've mentioned, you know, um, and, and snap them up and even get, find success through direct mail or phone calls or whatever. Uh, which is exactly what we did. So the, there's more of opportunity there to buy from mom and pops. Uh, second, on the management upside, if you buy from a mom and pop, oftentimes their financials are all messed up, right? You get them and then it's just like you have to decipher hier hieroglyphics to figure out what the heck is going on at this facility. Does it actually make any money? You know, but that's the beauty of it is that you can take something that's disorganized in a sense uh, and bring um, a level of quality to it right? Change the financials, raise the rent, or not change the financials, but improve the financials, raise the rents, improve the management. And sometimes that's as easy as having a website mm. and the ability yep. for people to rent online, yep. right? Yep. Like yep. go to the website, rent online or improving a website. There's a lot of websites that are just horrible and they look ugly and it's confusing. So it's really, it's kind of low hanging fruit in that sense. Now I'm not saying it's easy to find a deal and put it in a contract, but there's some uh, low hanging fruit in the terms of management improvements that can be implemented uh, at these facilities. So those, those are just really two reasons. I think there's more, but uh, those are the big two. Cool. Yeah, no, I mean, you convinced me um, and I'm sure there's yeah. some people out there listening who may, you know, their ears might've perked up um, now thinking about this self storage thing. So take up, uh, you know, take a step back. Um, you know, you have all this experience, put yourself in the shoes of someone who maybe they've uh, done a flip, they've done some, you know, they've owned some um, multifamily. They're, they haven't purchased the self-storage yet. Um, they're thinking about getting into it. You know, you, we already talked about kind of how you go about finding the deals. You either have to um, source them off market yourself, or you have to go to a, a broker. They usually have off market deals. Um, but once they actually find the property they want to buy, what are some some, um, I guess some things that are commonly overlooked or maybe different in the self-storage world, um, when it comes to due diligence, then, uh, um, that you would, you would point somebody to really, really be wary of when they go and do their, uh, do their due diligence. Yeah. Things to look out for, I would say one is in the financials. So if you're dealing with a mom and pop and it's dis a bit disorganized, right? They don't use proper property management software. Then you need to be aware of that. They can sell you a song and a dance and saying, oh yeah, you can get the rents to this. You know, I haven't raised rents in 10 years. Literally, I, like some of them say that I haven't raised rents in 10 years and three years or whatever. So your ears perk up like, oh my gosh, it's laying, I can, I can raise rents right away. We'll check the comps first. When mm. we look at a deal, we look at, we look at a couple things. One is we look at the market first. Actually, we don't actually look at the deal and start diving into financials. We look at the market. If I go to the market and I pull up the comps and the comps are all renting 10 by 10s for 60 bucks, you know, a month, great. We're at 60 cents a square foot. 
And then I look at the subject property, the one I'm targeting, and we're at 50 cents a foot. Okay, that's a story that's plausible there. But if the seller's telling me, oh, you can raise rents, I look at the market and the opposite is true. They're at markets at 60 cents and he's already at 70. Well, how am I going to raise rents, right? Where, where is the upside in that for, for me? So there's some of that going on. You got to just make sure that the market is telling you the same story that the owner is telling you. And then do they actually collect money? Are there warm bodies in these units? I have heard stories in the past where uh, an owner will fudge the numbers, so to say, or fudge the occupancy. They'll put locks on their rent units within the last month or three months. Uh, and it looks like it's rented, but it's not. It's actually the owner doing it. So I've heard of that in the past. Mm. It's somewhat rare, but it's something to be aware of. Uh, you'd want to get a rent roll to see who's actually renting. And if you're get buying from a mom and pop, it's good to get make a phone call to those tenants and ask them, hey, are you renting a unit here? You know, how long have you been here? Then you can actually ask them, how can we improve it? You know, we're, we're in a contract to buy this property. We're looking to improve it. How can we make your experience a little bit better? You know, so those are the little things that a person can do. It's a little bit harder to do some of that with the institutional stuff, but at the same time, harder meaning they won't give you like a whole thing with phone numbers and all that. But uh, at the same time, when you buy from an institutional seller, their stuff is going to be accurate. You don't have to worry about some of these things. Another thing, there's always pros and cons, always a trade-off. So another thing with the mom and pops is <coughs> we had, excuse me, we had one under contract. You got to know your contract and you got to know that, um, you want to deal with somebody who's willing to hire an attorney mm. from the get-go. There, and there's no such thing as a handshake deal. I want mm. to stress that. The reason we have contracts is because the people who did handshake deals broke that deal. Like they broke those promises. And that's why you have contracts. And that's why contracts get longer and longer with more and more points you know, to discuss and negotiate over because somebody in the past screwed someone else over. In, yep. in, a, in a contract or in a deal. So that's really important. You want to understand, you want to know that, hey, you have your protections, they have theirs, that your attorneys are involved in talking to each other. There's no such thing as a handshake deal. Everything needs to be written down on paper. So those are some of the things you want to look for. I'll, I mean, we can get into the details of like a survey, making sure there's no encroachments, get a survey done. Do not buy a property without a survey, whether it be an Ulta survey or a boundary at least. You know, something like that. You want to get a third party person to inspect the property, get a PCA, a property condition assessment. You want to get an environmental, a phase one. You do not want to buy a property without getting a phase one environmental done. We don't have to go into the details of what that is. People could look that up, but you want to make sure you get that done. Some of the basic things uh, like that. So I would, those are the things I would suggest uh, watching out for. Perfect. No, I love it. And I can definitely um, kind of you know, mirror or, or second your, uh, your concern about, um, mom and pop financials, because man, I've seen some things. Um, and a lot of times they complete <laughs> their, their, their business financials with their personal financials. And so you're, you'll be looking yeah. at their P and L and you'll just be like, what are all these things? Like really walk <laughs> through that, you know, with them line by line, ask them, what is this? What is this? What is this? And, uh, and really yeah. try to understand why, you know, how, what the big picture is. Um, and you know, you're yeah. Gonna, pull it apart from their personal life because that's just how it is in the in those deals yep yeah that's right awesome well hey man we have blown through our our time limit so i gotta push us into the quick question round you ready ready all right starts out with books i'm a big bookie so why don't you give me two book recommendations one for general life wisdom and one for uh real estate general life wisdom i would say the bible uh, beyond that, within the Bible, it's 66 books uh, for general life, wisdom, Proverbs, and Ecclesiastes, mm -hmm. right? Almost in the middle. Um, so you'd be surprised. People think the Bible is all about some like crazy stuff about snakes talking and people getting swallowed by whales and other things like that. I totally get it. But there's also a lot of practical uh, wisdom and advice uh, within, within there. I mean, it's written straight for wisdom. Those books are written to give people wisdom and advice in life. So uh, those are the ones I'd recommend for life. Uh, as far as real estate is concerned, you know, I'm, I'm going to go off on a little bit of a different path on this one. And I would recommend Basic Economics by Thomas Sowell. Uh, I was an econ major. I just finished the audio book of that. Um, and uh, uh, I really enjoyed that book. And in there, he talks a lot about different aspects of both business, economics, how it relates back to finance, uh, and then just other things as well to be aware of. So I think that's really important within real estate. If I look at rents, just the rent for something or the price of something can tell me a lot about that market 
and uh, the mindset and all kinds of information by just looking at price. We look at a price for a 10 by 10 or the price of a, uh, you know, like a uh, three or two bedroom apartment. And we wonder like, okay, that's just the price. And we might think that's just the price, but there's some, there's a lot more that goes on behind that number. If I look at a market, I look at the comps and the price for a 10 by 10 is a uh, climate control unit is 125. I immediately know much more about the market and the people around there who are willing to pay that and their incomes. I can almost guess what the income on average is going to be. I can almost guess what the household, uh, what the average house price of that market is going to look like. I can almost guess the type of uh, tenants I'm going to have. If it's lower than that, it's the same thing. So that, uh, I think that book really um, helps solidify some of that intuition that we can use as real estate investors. Cool, man. I love that. And, and Proverbs is for sure, it's a great book in the Bible. Um, I love, I mean, I love that you said that because there is so much wisdom in the, it's a pretty short, uh, short book, but um, yeah, Proverbs is great. Absolutely. I'm gonna have to check out the, the economics book because uh, you're right. I mean, you know, real estate is, is part of the, of the greater economy. And uh, if you really want to understand real estate, you got to understand the economy, you got to understand finances. So great recommendations. Yep. Um, and actually, Chris, before we go on to the next question, I'm going to ask, can you actually shut your video off? Because I'm getting a low bandwidth signal and I just want to make sure that we don't get, um, yeah, there we go. We get some crisp, crisp, uh, crisp audio here. So moving on, um, what were we, I lost my train of thought. There we are. All right. So, um, Habits. Habits are the foundation of our life. So if you could point to one habit that you feel contributes the most to your overall health, well-being, happiness, what would that be? Um, you know what? Getting up around seven or eight o'clock. Okay. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. Uh, I think that I start my day at that point in time and I have, a, I have a routine that I go through. And I found out I used to get up at like, sometimes I would get up at like three or four o'clock in the morning to get work done. Uh, and then, or, you know, I'm typically I would get up around six, five, six o'clock in the morning to start my day. I found that if I go to bed a little bit later and get up a little bit later, I actually feel better later in the day and I can get more done throughout the day versus getting up early. That's going to be kind of a contrary answer to, I think a lot of people, because they want to start their day and go after it. But not for me. I get up about seven, sometimes eight o'clock, and I feel great. And I can get literally eight hours of work done and be energetic in the afternoon like I am right now. Doesn't cool, bother man. me at all. No, I love it. And that just goes to show that um, you know everybody is different. Everybody needs, you know, it, it's not one size fits all when it comes to the human body. So some people like to get up at seven. Some people like to get up at five. Some people 10, you know, it's just whatever works for you. Um, and that's great that you found the, the key yeah. to, your own, to your own life there. Um, moving on. And so this one yeah. is for your younger self. So if you could go back to the Chris who, you know, didn't know anything about real estate. He was just going to UNC, I think it was Chapel Hill, he said. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. You know, he didn't, didn't know what he was going to do with the rest of his life. Go up to him, look him in the eye, give him one piece of advice moving forward. I'm thinking on that one. I probably would have told him to have different friends. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, and not that my friends were bad at all. Like there was nothing wrong with them. Like morally, they didn't, you know, tell me to go commit crimes or something like that. <laughs> we didn't go robbing people in the streets. But um, if I look back on that time in my life, nobody except for maybe one or two people, I mean, that I knew of was very ambitious mm. and wanted to learn about finance and build wealth for the future. Yep. And that's okay. I'm not saying that we have to have friends like that, right? I'm, I'm just saying for me, looking back, I would have surrounded myself with different people. Uh, and I think that that would have obviously, it would have, I don't think it would have affected uh, my outcome uh, and probably would have sped up the learning process a little bit more. So if I could go back and tell my younger self, I would say, walk and live your life with wiser people. Yep. No, I love that. There's uh, what's that? The phrase, um, you are the average of the five people you spend most yeah. time with. Um, I yeah. think that is a hundred percent true. And, and especially in your younger years, I mean, uh, you know, that time people you spend your time with, um, they really do shape at least that moment in your life. So if you can get 
you can get people around you earlier in your life um, that, that kind of have the, they're, maybe they're in the place that you want to be in um, that can definitely, definitely move things along faster. So great yeah. advice. Um, moving on to the second to last question in the quick question round. And this is like a, a medium que question round for us here. <laughs> We're not going quick, but it's nope. fun. Uh, <laughs> Second to last question. So United States, huge place to invest. There's so many square miles out there um, that a person can buy a plot of land. What is a good, what is the area that you are the most excited about right now? Uh, I think North Carolina, that's where I live. So I'm partial to that. Um, between Charlotte and Raleigh, there's so much growth happening right now. Um, mm. It's it's crazy. Um, and when I say that, I don't mean like, I don't mean that lightly. Like I forgot what the population growth of Charlotte is, but it's, it's, it's a lot. Uh, there's so much happening as far as development is concerned with both office retail, all kinds of stuff. There's cranes going up, going up everywhere in uptown Charlotte. Uh, same thing with Raleigh. They're announcing new projects. I mean, weekly uh, up there between office and retail and other um, obviously homes and apartments and all that stuff. So I would pick these two markets um, uh, and be excited about them in the future. Now, if I could live anywhere, it would be Colorado. So that would be that would be where I'd want to live. We were just uh, visiting there a couple, like about a month ago or so. But as far as growth and all that, that I would love, it's uh, Charlotte and Raleigh, North Carolina. Cool, man. I love that. Um, I was actually, I know this is not North Carolina, but uh, I was just in Charleston. Um, and my God, I love that city. It is, it is amazing. Yeah. Uh, that entire yeah. area, just love it. Um, yeah. Charleston's so cool. great. Charleston and Greenville. Greenville's nuts too right now in South Carolina. Yeah, no, beautiful, beautiful area. Great, great food, man. The lobster, whew, can get enough of that. <laughs> All right, so last question. You've given us a lot to think about um, during this episode, so I'm sure people listening want to reach out, say hi. What is the best way for them to do that? I'm on LinkedIn and Facebook. Just search for me there. I would say email, but that's not great because I don't want to respond to like 500 emails and I have like <laughs> try to focus my time. If you could say one other habit, it's actually doing one thing at a time and not checking email uh, often. Oh, yeah. So um, that would be another habit that I have as well. But uh, LinkedIn or Facebook is the best way to reach me. Just search and you'll find me. Cool. Sounds good. And I will put Chris's URL in the show notes. So if you want to reach out to Chris, just click the little more in the description, in the description, it'll pop down the full description in there. You can find the link, click through, say hi to Chris and that's it. So Chris, thank you very much for hopping on the show today. Awesome. Thanks, Gabe. Appreciate it. Absolutely. For everybody who's here with us today, thank you guys for showing up. You are the reason that we do this. So we appreciate having you here. If you have any questions whatsoever about what we talked about today, just reach out to me, Gabe, at the real estate investing club.com. Other than that, I hope you guys have an absolutely fantastic week. Keep rocking real estate. And I look forward to seeing you on the next episode. Thank you for joining us for another episode of the Real Estate Investing Club. I hope you guys enjoyed the episode as much as I enjoyed putting it on and were able to pull some actionable advice that you can apply in your own investing today in the field. Before you go, we have a gift for you. If you're a new investor looking to get started or an established investor looking to invest, take your investing to the next level. I've created an ebook just for you available on our website. This ebook ebook will cover how I was able to create both active and passive income in real estate with very little money to start with. In it, I will address the three most often cited obstacles new and veteran investors run into by showing you how to find deals that are actually deals, how to finance a deal with little to no money down and how to exit those deals for maximum value. And if you get the ebook today, I am throwing in a bundle of bonuses, seven of them to be exact. The first one will be the off-market lead generation blueprint, which will take you through the exact systems and processes we use to generate off-market leads like clockwork, which is the most important skill when it comes to creating wealth in real estate. The second bonus is the A to Z REI systems and vendors guide, which will allow you to peek under the hood of our business and see the exact tools, systems, and even the vendors we use to see the success that we do. And the third bonus is the top 100 best performing keywords pack, which is which will give you the exact keywords we use to target motivated sellers online using PPC ads. The fourth bundle is, or the first fourth bonus is our contracts bundle for wholesaling and renting real estate, which will give you access to all the contracts we use in the field to execute all different types of transactions. 
After that is the investors quick analysis calculator and offer tool, which will allow you to quickly calculate whether a deal is an actual deal and will allow you to create an offer automatically with, from those calculations. This is a lot of uh, a lot of bonuses that I said. I'm just going to keep going down the list. Number six is the investor's daily success tracker, which is a tracker you can use to ensure you are taking the right actions day in and day out to reach your financial goals in real estate. And the last bonus is the wholesalers template for quick assignment cash, which will give you the templates we use to present our wholesale deals professionally and efficiently to our buyers. Whew, that is a bundle. So it's a mouthful. You get all of those bonuses for free when you download the ebook. All we charge is the admin cost to run the show. So if you're interested in the ebook and the bonus bundle, head on over to the website at therealestateinvestingclub.com. Click on get the ebook bundle at the top of the page to take advantage of that deal. And with that said, I hope you have a fantastic day and even better week. Keep rocking real estate. And I look forward to seeing you on the next episode. <laughs>